advice. Remember, nothing in this video should be taken as financial advice. It's okay to be annoyed by people. I'm sure you're annoying to others too. We're creating more safety. Well, let me ask you this. Will you do another ETF? How about an XRP ETF? I know you got e Ether out there. Mm, I, we, How about XRP? Can we, you answer that? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want me to. I do. Well, I can't. <laughs> All right. He's not allowed to answer if they're going to make an XRP ETF. Now, Charles Gasparino gets out on Twitter and starts stating that Larry Fink doesn't even know about XRP. So uh, don't take any of this as anything positive. But that's not exactly true because some of the big players from BlackRock later moved on to Ripple. So first of all, Craig Phillips joined the board of Ripple. He worked for BlackRock and also worked under Secretary Treasury Steve Mnuchin, and he came up with Executive Order 1377-2. Now, Phillips helped BlackRock earn $1.6 billion through his leadership and financial markets advisory group. You're going to remember somebody that makes you $1.6 billion. Robert Michnick also worked for Ripple Labs and then moved to the head of digital assets for BlackRock. So he worked for both Ripple and BlackRock, and he was head of digital assets for BlackRock. There was some fake news that came out about BlackRock actually launching an ETF. So um, actually launching an XRP ETF. So the utility that Larry Fink describes is the utility that the XRP ledger provides. It's perfectly aligned with Ripple's mission. The vision within BlackRock, look what it did. Why are you doing this now? And we believe it's so important to be anticipating the next move. I would also say on the, on the beginnings of, um, of a ETF Bitcoin, we believe ETFs are a technology no different than Bitcoin was a technology for, for asset storage. We believe the next step going forward will be the tokenization of financial assets. And that means every stock, every bond will have its own basically QSIP. It'll be on one general ledger. Every investor, you and I, will have our own number, our own identification. We can rid ourselves of all issues around illicit activities about bonds and stocks and digital by having a, 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 a tokenization. But the most importantly thing, we can customize strategies through tokenization that is, if it's every individual, we would have instantaneous settlement. Think about all the costs of settling bonds and stocks. But if you had a tokenization, everything would be immediate because it's just a line item. And so we believe this is a technological transformation for financial assets. I believe if, if you want to talk about like voting and voting choice and all the things, if, every, if we know every moment who is the owner of that stock and it's now time to vote, every individual who has ownership is identified and they can vote their own shares. Is this the end? Crypto Ari discovered that Ripple joined BlackRock JP Morgan as a leading trade association for ISDA, which is the standard organization for securities and derivatives exchanges. Now, Larry Fink mentioned QSIP. QSIP is a system for codes that tell you exactly what investors are purchasing. They're purchasing ETFs, derivatives, public, public stocks, private stocks. It doesn't matter. These QSIP codes tell you exactly what the individual investor is investing in. So this is a perfect use case for blockchain technology. Right now, the MICA regulations are allowing crypto companies to work within the EU. So some of these companies are already developing, already evolving, and they're going prime time. Now, the United States is slower behind, but once these regulations pass, these companies will be scooped up in a heartbeat and they'll start applying it to U.S. US investments. Larry Fink is focused on utilities, not focused on a store of value. He's focused on the utility of crypto assets. It's a very different thing. Now, I think that the, the number one rule that any leader has, especially in our industry, is you got to be able to protect your clients and you got to be able to take care of your, your shareholders while you're doing that. And you're going to deliver value to each of those through, through your employees and your people. The, the biggest concern, and I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy and, and I'm not a doomsday guy, but with the geopolitical situation, the way it is in the world today, and I, I worry about that. That's one of the things that keep me up at night. There are a lot of ways you can bring down a country. Okay, chemical, biological might be one of them. But maybe the two most significant ones would be nuclear and cyber. 
So cyber is as important as it has ever been in the history of mankind. It's going to be more important tomorrow and more important down the road. So what are our leaders in those areas doing to, one, make sure that they secure the right talent, they have the right resources, and they're doing everything they possibly can to protect their platforms against people that are bad actors and want to be able to take advantage. So I think, you know, to me, that's a big, 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 big deal. Yeah. And by the way, prior to the Bitcoin ETF news coming out, the SEC's Twitter handle was hacked and it said that all of the ETFs were passing. Now, the SEC came out and said that wasn't true, but it really was true. So this tells you that cyber actors are uh, are in these systems. They know the news before it happens. Now, this is why Bitcoin was moving be- prior to, to this ETF news, because the insiders knew. And information is is money. And this is this is what's happening on a grand scale. And this is this is the vulnerabilities of the internet today. The web 2.0 has a ton of vulnerabilities that hackers are exploiting. So think about that. Hackers knew this information prior to it being publicly announced. That means the SEC's computer systems are at risk, and blockchain technology is a solution to these cyber threats. By integrating computation and data storage directly into the blockchain, the internet computer ensures that data is secure, tamper-proof, and always available without the need for intermediaries. The platform's native tokenomics and governance model also incentivize developers and users to participate in a self-sustaining ecosystem where improvements and updates are continuously integrated. This creates a dynamic and responsive environment that can adapt quickly to the needs of users and the market. In essence, the internet computer's on-chain fluent architecture heralds a new era of IT, where decentralized applications can operate with unprecedented efficiency, security, and scalability, challenging the status quo of traditional information technology systems. Imagine a scenario where you wish to download an app like MetaMask, which is typically hosted on platforms like AWS or Google Play Store. ICP allows for direct access to such apps, bypassing conventional hosting services. This approach is distinctly different from traditional ledgers like XRP, ETH, or Bitcoin, which may offer smart contract functionality to transfer assets under specific conditions. ICP extends beyond this by enabling services like email, web hosting, and other cloud computing functions in a decentralized manner marking a significant shift in digital infrastructure. The Definity Foundation came out in 2015, and there's, I believe, over 270 members. And uh, most of the citizens are in Switzerland because they were first to adopt crypto regulations. Now, 1,600 plus research papers came out of the Definity team, uh, 100,000 plus academic citations, and over 250 technical patents. Now, They were part of early blockchain communities like Google, IBM, Facebook, and Apple. To me, that wouldn't make sense. But you know what? Again, I couldn't write the timeline of this industry if I wanted to. So anything is possible. But look, BSEC met with issuers over the holidays. Clearly, there's time pressure here. They want to move forward. And lastly, you know, BlackRock, Larry Fink, they are a really important part of U.S. capital markets. They're incredibly close with the Biden administration. I don't believe they would push forward so aggressively if they did not believe that there was a good probability that this was getting approved. So if you remember the timeline, the crypto bros such as Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF, Grayscale's uh, Bitcoin Trust, they were trying to push for these ETFs to come true. And it's not until BlackRock threw their hat in the ring before the timeline started getting shorter and shorter. And that's when everything got approved. As soon as BlackRock threw their hat into the ring, everything got approved. So that just shows you the power that Larry Fink has. And Larry Fink was talking about QCIP. He's talking about redefining the stock market, the equity market. And in a prior interview, he was talking about the debt market to be put on distributed ledgers. Coin, because I, sure. this is a huge thing. I mean, I, I see it as the minute Larry Fink put his imprimatur on this yeah. thing, it was going to go through. You, you don't have to take credit for it, but you can. Yeah. can are, is it you that pushed this? Because Gensler hates it. I mean, they were dragging their feet on this for, thing for years. There are still a lot of people who hate it. So but I, Gensler still hates it, apparently. So <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about Gary, but... Uh, <laughs> 
But I did believe, and it still remains, and this is Gary's position, right. that it, it's still a one of the vehicles for illicit activity. So I think no one can deny that. Where I came around to it, and I came around to a different interpretation three years ago, that there's a lot of merit to it. There's a lot of opportunity. It is a great store, and this is where you can debate. Is it a good store? But you know how it's made. A bunch of computers figure out. But there's problems. only. But the issue is if there, if people believe that it can be a, an asset that can be cross border, right. and let's be clear, if you're in a country where you're fearful of your government, and maybe this is one of the reasons why China has banned it. Mm -hmm. If you're in a government where you're, if you're in a country where you're fearful of your future, fearful of your right. government, or you're frightened that your government is devaluing its currency by too much deficits. Like us. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> go to the little elephant in the room here. Yeah. <laughs> you could say this is a great potential long-term store of value. And it, as I said, it's like digital gold. And I, BlackRock was the reason why the United States government did going direct, which was where they handed out stimulus checks. So there they were the reason why the inflation got as bad as it did. Now, Larry Fink's on Fox News telling Charles Gasparino that, you know, if you're afraid that your currency is going to be devalued, Bitcoin is it, or if you're an authoritarian government, that maybe that's why China banned it. He also says the cross-border nature, it's a cross-border ledger. And so he sees the fundamental value in something that's cross-border instantaneously being able to authenticate things. So he's really in it for the utility of crypto. Although Bitcoin's the talking point because the Bitcoin is most popular, but he's really in it for utility, not necessarily digital gold, however. Um, with things turning the way they are, we were at $34 trillion in, in debts and deficits. It was just a quarter ago, we were at 33. So this is rapidly going to pick up pace. And my position is anything is better than, than fiat at this time. Maybe right up there with uh, when the first Bitcoin purchase happened, you know, for a, a piece of pizza, I think for 25,000 Bitcoin or something. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. But there's been a lot of historic moments along the way. And, um, you know, my hope is that we get many more of these. Um, I'm not sure what the next one would be. Maybe maybe a central bank um, holding Bitcoin, something like that would be a next milestone. We'll see. Brian Armstrong, uh, Coinbase is listed as the custodian on many of these Bitcoin ETFs, not all of them, but many of them. And now he's saying that the next largest milestone is a central bank owning Bitcoin. Now, that certainly is a way to usher in the crypto economies by having central banks custody digital assets. Now, he's in the know. He's, he's working with BlackRock, so it wouldn't surprise me to hear something like that, especially with some of the smaller countries like Argentina or some of the countries that have faced hyperinflation. So I think there is significant appetite. And I actually think even though we're going into an election year in the U.S., as we are in many parts of the world, some of the biggest uh, champions, I would say, uh, people who understand the importance of regulation, not necessarily pro-industry, but folks who understand this are either not running for office or are really looking to get something across the line before they retire in some cases. And so I think we have a window here to really get something done, particularly because we have two bills that have passed the House, come out of committee and that are, are waiting for a floor vote, rather. So we are hoping that we'll see something in the early days of this year. Now, I think the limiting factor here is not the election, as many think. The limiting factor actually is the fact that we have a complicated and challenging congressional makeup right now. Right now, just watching this budget process play out and watching how challenging it's been to get agreement on what the parameters around the budget of one of the biggest you know, countries in the entire world is, it does not necessarily portend an, an easy process. That being said, I do think that things like the spot ETF and the appetite you're seeing for this kind of connection to traditional financial institutions injecting their capital into this space and creating a whole new suite of products and services around that kind of intersection is going to open up more awareness from those who've been maybe hesitant or on the sidelines to understand why regulation is so essential.
Jill Warren states that we're going to see regulation in the beginning of this year, and we're already seeing the Bitcoin ETF. At the same time, debts and deficits are hitting record highs. In three months, we hit $33 trillion. Now we're at $34 trillion. This is record high numbers, and it's going to continue. The Bitcoin ETFs are important because it gives institutional investors a way, a path to invest into crypto assets. So they've been buying Bitcoin via ETFs and we've been seeing record high volumes with Bitcoin ETFs. Now, in my mind, eventually this is going to evolve into utility. People that invest in crypto want to see what is it, what is it actually good for besides just holding. The problem with people who have no vices is that generally you can be pretty sure they're going to have some pretty annoying virtues. Thanks everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. If you enjoy content like this, please consider joining my Patreon or my ghost site tmjr.ghost.io.